and I watched The Glass Key. Uh, the Glass Key, uh, you don't know it, but you do. It's a Dashiell Hammett novel turned into a movie, and then it was very freely adapted by the Coen brothers to make Miller's Crossing. Veronica Lecce's in it. You'll recognize a lot of things from Miller's Crossing in that movie. Uh, I recognize a lot of Coen Brothers things from Sullivan's Travels, another Veronica Lake movie. That's right. Well, they're from the land of 10,000 lakes, but instead they're focusing on that one lake. Just one lake. Lake Veronica. Mm -hmm. Lake Veronica. Isn't that that big lake in Africa? Lake Victoria. Ah, True. Just down the road from Lake Titicaca. (laughs) That's every young boy's favorite lake. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. How do I introduce tonight's movie? I have no idea. Because tonight, we are watching The Boy with the Green Hair. Released in 1948, TBWGH stars a fresh-faced young lad named Dean Stockwell. And Basement alum Robert Ryan. This is also the feature film debut of a young Russ Tamblin in an uncredited role. The movie was directed by Basement alum Joseph Luzzi. I was inspired to watch this movie by everyone's favorite curmudgeonly New Yorker, Fran Leibowitz. She tells a story of her childhood in Morristown, New Jersey, where the TV station, when they had a movie of the week, they showed it every night of the week. And so she entered a cinema immersion tank of her own, watching The Boy with Green Hair all five nights, but only seeing the first half because of a strict mother and an early bedtime. She didn't get to see the second half until decades later. So Fran, this one's for you. We're watching the whole thing. Tonight's gift might just help you become the boy with the green thumb. A miniature greenhouse. You can grow your own cactus. I can. It gives me sand, a terrarium, and a pill. (laughs) I eat the pill, I lay down to the sand, and I enclose myself in the terrarium, and I'll see cactuses everywhere. It's going to be a trip right through Tucson, man. Well, the movie poster for this pleads with us, please don't tell why his hair turned green, but this is Welcome to the Basement, and we're going to spoil the heck out of that. So get ready to find out information about the boy with green hair. All that green stuff that's hair? No. This is a close-up of his head? No, it's not. Okay. Late one night, a few cops are grilling... Child. All we want to know is your name. Just your name. Stanton Finkelbort. <laughs> Why, I tell people my name a hundred times a day. Not my real name. No, sir. If they knew my real name, I'd be arrested for being a police impersonator. In a police station, we see a bald boy. What's your name? Luther. Lex Luther. A local psychiatrist drops by. He brings him a malted chocolate thing and a a snack to eat. And then the kid starts spilling the beans. Like that time I went to live with Grant. He put it in a book and I tore it. Now, just a minute. If you're going to tell me this, you'll... uh... You'll have to be Mirandized so I can use it against you in a court of law. His parents went away to do something and they never came home. And he was shuttled around to all kinds of different relatives. Finally ending up with Gramp. He used to be in show business. Show business, eh? No, I'm sorry, the shoe business. His name was (laughs) Thomas McCann. (laughs) Once known as Gramp the Great. I wonder if you'd drop over to my royal palace next Saturday night and do a few numbers for me. I'm having some kings and queens over. And a couple of princes, too. Be sure to bring a key to drop into the special bowl. Gramps is an old song and dance man. Do you want proof? Well, here's a song. He does not dance. Oh, tread on the tail of me coat. Ha ha! Tread on the tail of me coat. If you're in for a wee bit of action, just tread on the tail of me coat. Faith and or Begora. Anyway, I want to live with Gramp. I tread on the tail of his coat once and he got very upset. (laughs) In real life, when you do that, you get liquor bottles thrown at you. He shows the boy his apartment. They had to bring in a double to do the juggling. (laughs) Patrick O'Brien, you're a sham. His walls hang with past glories and ex-girlfriends. Eileen. Come on, Eileen. Golly, she's got a can on her. Woof. Like a tread on the tail of her coat, if you know what I'm saying. (laughs) Oh, then I came to America. I got conscripted by Lincoln into the Civil War. I'm, I'm a very old man, boy. I was alone for three days once. 
in a cave with a tiger. You don't say. What happened? He's usual suspecting him. <laughs> He's making up shit based on what's on the behind him. That kid is Kaiser Soze. Grandpa's still a performer. An ordinary waiter, he just sort of brings you your food. Ah, but a singing waiter. He annoys the hell out of you. The days may come and the days may go. Gee, who would want that? Yeah. That sounds worse than one of those restaurants that lead with, have you ever eaten here before because we do things differently. <laughs> See, before you, you see a list of, of food words. <laughs> this is called our menu. And you select your food from that list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know how these things... Yeah, but then we bring them on plates that are slightly different sizes. <laughs> Gramp works nights, so that means that Peter, that's the boy's name, has to stay alone at bedtime. And he has to be alone in the dark. There's nothing in the dark that wasn't there when the light was on. Except the Babadook. You know about him, don't you? Well, here's a book. Read all about him. I'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> Soon it's the first day of school and Gramp walks him all the way there, introducing him to everyone in town. My grandson. Dad in the school this morning. Fine looking boy. Let me give you some good advice, young man. Study hard. Or else you'll be a miserable milkman. My grandson starting to school this morning. Nice looking boy. Starting to school this morning. Oh, fine looking boy. Hello there, fence. This is my grandson. First day of school. Why, hi there, thin air. This is my grandson. First day of school. Talk on the head of me coat. Grandson goes to school. He starts to make friends. Hey, you want to play? Me? I don't care. That's how you get what you want, kid. You pretend you don't want it, and then they give it to you. That's how you get what you want, kid. He's got a good life. He's happy. Something's going to come along and mess it up. Staying all by myself didn't bother me anymore. I wasn't even afraid of the dark. I found a new hobby, thanks to the picture of Eileen on the wall. <laughs> how many miles to Dublin Town? For a star again, sir. Chip, chip, my little horse. Chip, chip, again, sir. Can I get there to be candlelight? Your mother was a hamster. He gets involved with the clothing drive for the war orphans. You know, kids who've lost their home, they've lost their parents, and they need help. One of the kids tells Peter, hey, you're a war orphan because your parents are gone because of the war. I am not, he says, and he gets all angry about all this. Gramp tells him that actually your mother and father were killed in London during the Blitz. They were there helping children. Why are they helping other children when they've got me, I need help, and, I, and that I'm abandoned? He's got a point. Miss Bran, are they real children or are they just made up? They're crisis actors. <laughs> Gramp and Peter have dinner. When everything is feeling and looking sorry and gray-like. Sure, that's why I keep a bit of green about always. <laughs> Gramp gives him some advice, which I forget all of it. But I guess it's something that came out to don't be afraid of the dark. The world will keep on going for a long, long while. Unless the sun explodes. Did anyone talk to you about that? It's a slight possibility, very slight, but it could still happen. I was taking a bath, and that's when it happened. What was it that happened? It's no use, you won't believe me. I said I would. Now tell me what happened. You've eaten my hamburger and you've drunk my milkshake. Drainage! <laughs> yeah, it's Shit. pretty hard to be Daniel Lee Lewis, isn't it? <laughs> he has green hair! The what? Wait a minute. Nobody told me this was what the movie was about. Yeah, you guys. That boy truly is a candy colored clown. <laughs> green hair is people. This is crazy, and I love it. What did you do, my boy? How why is your hair green? I don't know, just turn that way. All right, it's time for us to have a talk. Boys around your age go through a change. <laughs> Normally it's not this change, but, you know, take what you can get. Let's take you to the doctor, have you checked out. As they're walking along... Isn't it super? Super! The girls find you dreamy, Peter. Run with it. Yeah, Peter, come on, man. Go for it. And uh, what about the lad? He has green hair. What? I've given him every test I can think of. Well, I've yet to inject radium into his veins. Perhaps that'll help. He's making medical history. 
I'd like to go down in medical history, Mr. Shankly. Peter is sad. He thinks his life will never be normal again. And it's another long walk to school as everyone in town is staring at Peter. Ah, it's enough to make one's blood boil. And to make one's boils bloody. <laughs> he goes to school. All the kids make fun of him. Peter fries a green Peter fries a green Peter fries a green Get him! Mother's awfully worried. Mother said it might be catchy and I shouldn't get too close. Oh, you little conformist. He can't go to school anyway. Why can't I? Because you can't. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I've been made assistant principal. There's been budget cuts. Miss Brandt tries to help him out. How many children have black hair? How many children have brown hair? Green hair? Zero. <laughs> and red hair? Frank. Get him! Get him! Frank! Get him! Four children have black hair, 11 have brown hair, nine have blonde hair, one has green hair, and one has red hair. Are there any questions? Are we going to be tested on this? Peter's still sad. He runs off to the woods to be by himself. Peter came across a squirrel with a green tail. They became fast friends. The squirrel spoke like a human and told him all about the coming darkness. Where'd he go? Where did the boy go? I can't see him anymore. Huh? Ear in a field. Blue velvet. That's right. Well, I guess that is a human ear. <laughs> Peter. Peter. Pumpkin. Eater. And he's confronted by a vision. All of those war orphans. They come to him in a phantasm. We're just out here re rehearsing a production of Skin of Our Teeth, looking for somebody to play the mammoth. Thornton Wilder humor. Kids love it. Peter of the green hair. Your hair is wonderful. Your hair says to people how bad war is. You have to tell everyone about how war is bad because people will listen to you because you're different. Because historically, that's what happens. Different people get listened to all the time. Peter is revved up by this new mission. He loves his green hair. He has purpose. He runs around. He tells all the adults the things that he learned from the ghosts. Hey, you little pinko scumbag. He's out playing one day, and a bunch of young tough boys set upon him. They're gonna cut off his hair whether he likes it or not. Come on, let's get it. One of the boys loses his glasses. Whoa, I lost my glasses. Help, help, I lost my glasses. I can't see if help. I glasses. help, help. Craig, I lost my glasses, help. Help! Oh, there you oh go, thank man. you. Oh, but whoa! Hmm, I can read again. Peter gives him his glasses back like a nice guy, but the kid is a little turncoat. Hey, I've got him! I've got him! Peter barely escapes. Maybe it's time to cut your hair. The final betrayal from the one person he could trust. The one person who's been cool with this the entire time. So Peter goes with Gramp to the barber. The barber cuts off all of his green hair. Peter is a bald-headed boy. He went from being classic punk to more of like uh, skinhead punk. Like West Coast punk. Yeah. It's that... I'm sorry. I forgot my lines. Could we do, do it? Should I go back to one? <laughs> I feel ashamed. Did he just say I feel shitty? Ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> Ashamed man. Yeah, he said I feel that shitty in 1952 kind of means on film. the same thing. He packs up his meager possessions. He's going to run away from home. He would wrap barbed wire around that baseball bat and become Negan. <laughs> and we're back to the present at the police station. I think there's someone outside these doors, Peter, that you need to see. It's Gramp, Dr. Knudsen, and Miss Brandt. Dr. Knudsen throws down. Throws down? Dr. Knudsen throws down. He will... <laughs> He will mess you up if you get on his bad side. <laughs> Gramp says, let's go home, boy. We'll put a sock over your head or whatever. People won't see your bald head. And he believes that when his hair grows back... It's going to grow back green. And he will remain the boy with the green hair. I throw down. Good night. I'll be coming for you. You'll never see my fists <laughs> when they <Not> show up. <laughs> I just want to start off by saying that young Dean Stockwell had it all together. That kid smolders. He's a very good actor, 
at a very young age. Yeah, and he approached that character with a specific point of view. We've mm -hmm. seen so many child actors on this show. They're just being cute kids. It seems like he did a lot of work going yeah. into this movie. This guy is shell-shocked. He's been traumatized by losing his parents and being shuttled around the country. So he's falling into more of the Freddie Bartholomew and Roddy McDowell camp of... Very gifted yeah, child very actors. Yeah, very gifted, yeah. Dean Stockwell, talented kid. He does Long Day's Journey Tonight. He's nominated for an Oscar for that. Okay. His career didn't really do much for the rest of the 60s or 70s. Yeah, he, he Blue Velvet. Out. Blue yeah. Velvet was his comeback. Mm -hmm. So what happened there? I don't know. I read about it when he died. I read a few obituaries that he just kind of bottomed out for a while. I don't know how he rose back up, but Blue Velvet and... Uh... Quantum Leap, of course. Yeah. It is a very leftist movie. It's really odd that this soon post-war that something this far to the left would be released by a mainstream Hollywood studio. And not just this far to the left, because it's not some like gentleman's agreement where they're like, we should be nice to Jewish people. War is bad. I know we just got done with the good war, but it was messed up. And we're not even talking about things. This was a, the good war. Let's not have another good war. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of messages going on mm -hmm. here. Messages that are conveyed by the green hair. Some of them obvious, some of them not so much. Obviously, messages of prejudice and nonconformity, that's very clear. How'd you like to have your sister marry somebody with green hair? Okay, I'm getting it. I don't necessarily see the connection between the green hair and anti-war. Even though they explain it, it still doesn't make much sense. People were saying that this was some sort of badge or some sort of honor for mm -hmm. them. And maybe the idea is that these war orphans are the invisible casualties of war. Human collateral that gets forgotten about. And this kid is one of those orphans. And so by having this green hair, he's unignorable. I don't recall going from liking a scene to disliking a scene so quickly as the scene with the war orphans. When they first all appear, it was one of the closest I've ever come to crying on the show here. That is just a really beautiful shot. And particularly since whoever took the photographs of the posters, they made them really look authentic. And so when you see the kids, they're like, oh, did they go to England and find that kid in that photo? Did they go to China to find that little girl? Once they started talking, saying the same thing slowly over and over again. All right, we get the point. It's not a good script. I think that's the worst thing about the movie. Well-intentioned and very ham-fisted. It seems like a, a good TV movie. Now, it's an interesting story. Right in the middle of production, the studio, RKO, switched heads. It was taken over by Howard Hughes. And he did not like the anti-war message. Well, that's how Hughes made his money. Right, exactly. And drills. And so he tried to soften the message of pacifism. To make it more sort of like, go America, you know, we're great. So... Howard Hughes had an angry confrontation in his office with a young Dean Stockwell. No. Oh. Because he wanted him to insert a line of dialogue that was not necessarily pro-war, but pro-America and pro-military. And Stockwell wouldn't do it. Huh. Ten-year-old kid. And he stood his ground and he would not budge. And Hughes was furious. And decades later, Dean Stockwell would go on to portray to Howard, Howard Hughes. Hughes. That's right. In Francis Coppola's Tucker, the Man in His Dream. Another fun fact about this is on film prints, traditional 35 millimeter prints, they have these little marks that appear. They're known as cigarette marks. They talk about them in Fight Club. They signal the projectionist in the movie theater to change the reels. They're normally black. In this movie, they are green. And on the movie poster, please don't tell why the boy's hair turned green. No one knows. It's never revealed. Seems a very sneaky marketing ploy there. Yeah. Because people going here to find out why his hair turned green are going to be very disappointed. Yes, and it makes this movie sound a lot more like a William Castle movie. I like the way the colors popped. The green does look very, very effective. I'm glad it wasn't in black and white. What would that movie have been like? Seeing this on a black and white TV. I saw a movie called The Monster from Green Hell. It's about a monster from the jungle. Yeah. But it's in black and white. Why would you put a color into any title of a black and white movie? There's no point. I, I don't know. It only makes you sit there and think you're thinking green, but you're not seeing green. That has to affect your enjoyment well. somewhat. The boy with the green hair has left the barbershop, and now it's time to... Cut on over... To seen it. Clayton S. 
writes, Please have a mate wand report. I saw this fairly recently. I'm not sure how many John Sayles movies I have seen. I certainly want to see more. I like the economy of the story. This is a real meat and potatoes movie. Yeah. Like, there's nothing challenging about it. It just tells a story. Yes. The characters' motivations are very clear. Even the guy who played the warden in the Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. who starts off being a nice guy, you know he's going to be an asshole. Yeah. Because it's that guy. All right. This movie is about uh, the coal mining wars uh, that happened in West Virginia. Virginia in the 1920s, yeah. the Mingo County War, and compare that with the boy with green hair. Matewan has messages sewn into the cloth of the story, yes. as opposed to it being the cloth. Sometimes you see a movie and there's a number of characters in it. You can't quite follow the story arc. There's like 30 characters in Matewan. In a two-hour movie. You know them all. You know them all. You know the beginning, middle, and ends of all of their stories. Luke Maudsley. I know Matt loves musical biopics and the Beatles, so I'm just curious whether he's ever let those interests cross over and watched one of the many films about them. Yes, I saw Backbeat. Seen it. Seen it. This is the story of the Beatles in Hamburg, and really it's about... A relationship between two men that is the true platonic ideal. They yeah. have this love between them that is as intense as love between two lovers, yet there's no sexual element to it. The two men being John Lennon and Stu Sutcliffe. Yes. And so that's kind of the source of the tension in that Stu, Slu Stu, Sutcliffe. Stu Sutcliffe falls in love with Astrid, the photographer, mm -hmm. and so that sort of takes him away from John. John is struggling with his feelings for Stu. He doesn't want to seem like a queer... That's kind of the meat of the movie. Yeah. And then it's also about a band getting better and approaching stardom. And this is the type of musical biopic I like because it doesn't follow all the beats that we get from Respect and Ray and all that. It's just telling this one particular story from a 10-year-long career. So it's only like a year in the life. KDS writes, You guys seen Michael Mann's Thief with James Caan? Yeah, I seen it. Seen it. I don't know where to start. I guess I would start at the very beginning, where over the opening credits we see James Caan real deal breaking into a safe. <clears throat> and it's pretty captivating. What a way to start a movie. Okay, I'm in. I'm in right now. <laughs> the big heist in the center of the movie, how do they not burn down that entire building? Just the amount of flame that they need to get through that safe. Yeah. But yeah. you know they're doing it for real when you're watching it. And if you've ever wanted to see Jim Belushi... Take a shotgun blast to the chest. And I know many of you probably have. This is your movie. There is a scene in one of my favorite places in it. They have these oases when you're going down to Chicago. Oh, yeah. There's two rest stops that have a bridge going over the highway that had a little food court in it. Khan and Tuesday Well to have this very long conversation sitting in a booth right above the highway there. It just makes me feel so warm. They're at this location that when I was a kid I usually just... Stand and looking out the windows like cars are coming under me. Basic drumming. Go to the Barnes Museum. Watch Art of the Steel. Seen it. I don't know this. I have not seen the Barnes Museum because it does not exist anymore. Dr. Barnes, back around the turn of the century, had a great eye for art. And he had impeccable taste. And he bought it very cheaply. He had dozens and dozens of Matisse's and Renoir's. He had Modigliani's. He had 44 Picasso's. I think he had seven Van Gogh's. At the time of his death, his art collection, 9,000 pieces, was worth $25 billion. <coughs> and it was all housed in the Barnes Museum. Now, Dr. Barnes hated the art intelligentsia of Philadelphia, and he hated the Philadelphia Museum. And they were always pressuring him, let us take your art, we'll put it in our museum, we'll store it properly, let us take your art, and it'll travel around the country. No, my art is not going anywhere, and it is not going in your museum. And he died, and that was the stipulation of his will. My art collection will never get into the possession of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Now, what do you think happened? Uh, they got it. They got it, yes. I'm very conflicted about this because his art was not thrown on a bonfire. It's right there for everyone to see. He arranged it in a very unique way, and the museum did preserve his arrangement. So this story isn't a tragedy of art. It's a tragedy of the law. Mm -hmm. Because basically it means that no matter what your final wishes are, no matter how much you've got written in legal ink, if there's somebody with money and they want your shit, they will take it. And so that's really the part about this story that makes you go, Ugh. 
All of you boys and girls should check out our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. It has all of our episodes there, the entire catalog, and there are PayPal donation buttons that you can click on and donate a one-time or rolling monthly donation to support our show. This donation can be a very small amount. You could even do it right now. Go on over to our website, click on the thing, do a $2 rolling donation. Go do it. We'll wait. Ah, I see you're back. Thank you. I have a comment from one of our donors. It's Nick who says, as someone who's been watching since season four, I can honestly say that this is one of my favorite series to watch on YouTube. Thank you for making me laugh and experience new genres of film. You're welcome, Nick. You can also watch Unboxing, which comes out this coming Friday. That is more Craig and Matt chat. Also, mail, surprises, questions answered. Take a look. Now watch this. Candy and tobaccos and baked goods? What the hell kind of store is that? And fruits and vegetables. Oh, it's just a market. Okay, yeah, never mind. <laughs> what? They sell batteries as well? He has green hair.